we are not without talent and knowledge in this community. And Don Johnson has very kindly agreed to step forward. She is an elder of the Upper, Upper Samil Kameen Indian Band. She's also part of a, a very long-standing family in this valley who knows a lot of stories and a lot of history and a lot of stories from the prehistoric times before written records were given. So I'm very pleased to invite Don Johnson to come and speak. I'm an elder of the Upper Smilkameen Indian Band. Uh, but before the two bands separated, which was quite a number of years ago, uh, I would have just said I'm from the Smilkameens. I have been very fortunate to know some of the elders who came before me, and of course the elders of my own family particularly my grandmother. The things that I'm going to tell you come from that source. Originally, there were people living in this valley who perhaps identified themselves as the milk means, I don't know. They were joined by another group, which today is referred to as the Ashnola Band. And I am a direct descendant of the first chief of the Ashnola Band, the guy who discovered the Smilkameen Valley on behalf of his tribe, which was not a large tribe at the time, and apparently was rather overpopulated by bachelors according to what my cousin told me. Um, he, my cousin was my mentor through learning all this, and he was an elder for the Institute of Indigenous Studies in Vancouver. And he had researched a great deal of the history from his elders. It seems that nobody really knows where the Ashnola Band originated. We do know that they lived uh, in the late 1700s with the Wishram, the Wasco Wishram people for nine years, and then they moved on to live with the Matau people for two years. They left the Mataus to go and live with the Nummi people from um, the West Coast. And when they traversed the mountains, they got there and found out that they were being chased away because there was sickness in amongst the Nummi villages. The sickness was smallpox undoubtedly contracted from contacts with uh, outsiders because the Russians used to come down the coast at that time and um, quite often there was trade or interactions between the two groups. In any case, the Ashnola group went back into the Cascade Mountains and wandered north. And um, one of the young fellows, 12-year-old, discovered the Ashnola Valley. And um, he found a way to get down from the mountains into the Ashnola Valley. If you're not familiar with the location, um, the Ashnola, Ashnola River enters the Similkameen River uh, just west of Karameas. And um, when the band descended into this valley, one of the things they noticed was there was very few men. Something had happened to the men, and there was mostly women, children, and old people of all kinds. Um, and this apparently really attracted all the bachelors who had come down out of the mountains. 
In any case, this band, um, shall we say, reconnoitered the valley and decided this was a wonderful place to live. As my grandmother expressed it, we were rich. We had everything we needed. The biodiversity of the Similkameen Valley is really very high. Um, and because the Ashnola Band had spent a great deal of time at uh, a major marketplace known as the Dolls, which is on the Columbia River, um, bordering Oregon and Washington. They looked around for trade goods. Um, trade goods from the interior were primarily, I would say, um, hides, skins, but there was one major thing that the Similkameen Valley had that was very, very pricey, and that was ochre. Ochre exists in the Similkameen in the Princeton area. Um, I'm sorry to tell you that you can't go and see the site that is considered the best place to get ochre, but if you go behind CIBC, you can pick it up. <laughs> um, this ochre is used for paint, and it was one of the top trade goods. Every summer, uh, before all the settlers came and, and the reserve system, the Similkameens would go up to Tulamine, and they had what they called the women's camp. It was a place where they had a trade fair, if you can call it that. The Stolos came, um, the Lilouettes came, all of the Kamloops area and Merritt area bands came, and they traded. One of the trade goods was the ochre powder that the Similkameens made. Now, it came in uh, more than one form. You could get the powder, or you could get it as grease, or you could get it as paint. Grease was really useful for painting on rocks and resulted in a whole lot of pictographs up and down <laughs> the Similkameen Valley. Um, and the paint, they traded for ulican oil, which makes really good paint. And um, it was, you, it, the thing about ochre when mixed with the oils, you could change the color of hides, for example, or you could use it as a coating for things. Quite often, it was used to paint symbols on the horses, and the symbols would describe who owned that horse, which um, probably saved a lot of grief all around. <laughs> I would like to mention something about the pictographs. Um, when archaeologists study pictographs, they will come up with some amazing conclusions about what they mean. And um, very often it's related to religious practices. Now there's another point of view which says it was Indian graffiti. So. Uh, always when you, you read about the pictographs, sort of, you know, keep a little skepticism in your mind. <laughs> I, I do know that some of the messages referred to where um, the bear killer 
better known as Cunisco, uh, was going or had been, because you see the bear sign. One of them has three lines underneath it, which means that he passed by there three days ago. There's nothing religious about that. Getting back to the history of, of the people in the Ashnola Band, um, along about, I would think it was 1802, um, they were well settled in the Similkameen. Uh, all those bachelors had found wives and were raising families. There was a bit of um, population explosion, but there was also a cultural division amongst the people who had lived here before the Ashnola Band came and the Ashnola Band itself. The cultural differences were very distinct and affected a lot of areas of their lives. For example, marriage customs, burial customs, and so forth. The original people became known as the Stewich, and quite a lot of them moved on and can be found today as descendants who live on the Coldwater Reserve near Merritt. Um, in her book, Susan Allison talks about, Susan Allison was the wife of one of the first settlers in the valley, and um, she talks about them putting the dead on platforms and leaving them in the open air. This was not the custom of the Ashnola band who buried their dead. And the marriage customs were a bit different too. I don't know much about the Stewitch custom, but the Ashnola band demanded a bride price, um, which Mrs. Allison thought was the equivalent of selling off one's daughters. That was not the case. The idea was that if a man wanted a wife, he had to uh, bribe the parents. And the reason for this was because amongst the Ashnolas, it was a matrilineal society, and the women owned the land. Consequently, the men had to move to where the woman lived and had to convince her parents that he was going to look after them in their old age. So they came with gifts. If a fellow was really poor, this meant that he at least had to have the very basic. He had to have a horse for his bride. Otherwise, forget it. It was the woman's responsibility to build a home for them. And um, he would move into the home that she had waiting for him when they married. However, if he chose to leave, particularly if she had children, he had to sneak out in the middle of the night with whatever he could pack on his horse and ride a long ways away because he might be killed by her family. So uh, it was all right if a couple agreed to separate because let's face it, not every couple got along well. But to abandon one's wife and children, that was really forbidden. So it was quite a cultural difference in this contact with people. Fortunately, the attitude of the band, and this, this is one of the 
important cultural differences is that they're great negotiators and they believe in cooperative rather than competitive behavior. So if you're not competing and you're cooperating, you get much better results. So there was no real conflict. Those Jewish people who chose to leave did so uh, as individuals and the rest stayed. Um, as first contact with Europeans was primarily with the French and with a French priest, uh, there was nothing unexpected about the first settlement that they encountered, which was the construction of Fort Okanagan. Now, settlements by strangers coming in was not news to the people here. They knew what was going on in the rest of North America. They expected it. And Chief Nicola, who was head of the, shall we say, the United Okan Okanagan Tribes, went to Fort Okanagan and they had a very nice meeting. It was very friendly. And of course, they were asked to bring in uh, the pelts for trade. This didn't go over very well at all because actually, uh, Nicola's, when he explained it, he said, they're lazy people. They don't want to go out and get their own. What really interested him was potatoes. So he managed to get a bag of potatoes. We don't know how big a bag of potatoes, but he took it back up to where he lived in the Merritt area. And they were planted the following spring. And he returned a year later um, from first contact with 400 pounds of potatoes in which the people at Fort Okanagan were not particularly interested. However, they did accept them, and they did do some trade, and um, it remained quite friendly. One of the things I will say about the history of the Similkameens is that conflict with the settlers has been few and far between. Uh, their method of dealing with the settlers was to make friends and work together as much as possible. And I have heard some of the old ranchers talk about how they worked together and the things that they did together and certainly that was the experience with my family. Uh, you didn't engage in conflict. You kept track of everybody and how they were doing, and you cooperated. This was to prove very important, <coughs> excuse me, in the general history of the Similkameen Valley. It exists today, and um, I think that if you were to ask anybody uh, who's lived here for a long time, they will say that they know lots of people in both the upper and lower Indian bands. And they may work with them, they may be related to them, but in any case, the conflict hasn't been there, which has been a really great advantage. As time went on, and there were many more settlers, um, many of the people from the Indian bands developed, thank you, developed um, businesses. And uh, 
this wasn't unusual either because uh, my great-great-grandparents had a horse ranch and they sold horses and um, and another thing that they did was uh, they uh, engaged in pack trains and freight wagons. I know that the Antoine family from Merritt also had a freighting business. And they went from Merritt to Tulamine to Kamloops. And Kamloops was the nearest uh, railway station. and. So they were busy making a, a living. And then uh, conflict did occur. And it's still the same old conflict. It's with the federal government and uh, the policies and bureaucracy. And of course, I don't have to tell you anything about it reserves, and residential schools. My great-grandparents married under British law in 1877 because my grandmother was an Indian, or my great-grandmother, rather, was an Indian. So was my great-grandfather, but he came from the United States, and that made him a white man. Um, because Canada didn't want any more Indians registered. Um, anyway, you could say they had to get married because if they weren't legally married, his wife would be sent to the reserve along with her children, and that wasn't going to happen. It became the most confusing system that you could ever imagine. And if you've ever dealt with Ottawa, you know how confusing and how difficult it can be to make any kind of a point with them. And you're never supposed to argue with policy. Many, many of the settlers were opposed to the reserve system. For one thing, I think, I'm not sure, I think I was eight years old, about 1947, when we could finally go to my mother's second cousin's place, which was four miles down the road, and actually go into their property and visit them. Otherwise, we had to do it over the fence because they lived on a reserve and we didn't. Um, the whole reserve system tore families apart like you wouldn't believe. If you can't visit each other without a permit from an Indian agent, what do you do? The other thing that it interfered with, of course, was the economics. People on a reserve couldn't run businesses and make a living. As a matter of fact, it was a federally imposed poverty system. Um, you couldn't acquire anything unless you got a permit to go and work for somebody. If you worked for them for more than six months and you were off reserve, you couldn't get back on the reserve and your family had to move off it. <coughs> In addition, there was a considerable uh, problem with land rights. If, for example, I'll give you an example, the Cochise sisters, they lived on a reserve about 15 kilometers downstream from Princeton, and one of them got married, the other one died. So it was no longer a reserve because nobody lived there. So it was preempted by a settler. This went on all over the place. This wasn't just in our valley, but it, the unfairness of the system, as I said, uh, became rather extreme for a long period of time. 
it still did not cause conflict between people here. In fact, down in Coston, one of the settlers and his friends built a schoolhouse and the children from the reserve were invited to get their education there. They never had to go to a residential school. This is the type of cooperation that has been the pattern here. I'm very pleased to say that we never had conflicts that so many other places did. Um, how's my time? Um, in the history of the Similkameen people, there has been a great readiness to adapt, to change, to become not European, but to become modern and to take advantage of, you know, modern life. Um, today, the band is that I'm with, the Upper Samilk Main Band, has an administration building which is primarily concerned with filling out paper for Ottawa. We are not allowed to get money without having a plan for where it's spent. And the paperwork is phenomenal. We also have a natural resources division. And um, within the administration building, which if you go down to Headley and the Grist Mill, you will see uh, it's quite a good sized building. It's the old Headley Elementary Secondary School, which is converted to the administration building. It has a teepee in front of it and some nice lawn around it. Um, we also have a separate building for um, early child care, up to age five. Another building for child care after school or um, if some other situation occurs. We have a building for teenagers, which includes a lot of gym um, equipment. Uh, and also they, they get um, guest speakers coming in to discuss various aspects of life today. One of them being um, exposure to kinds of employment that you might get if you went to college or vocational school or university. We have another building which is devoted, to, it's our health care department. And we do have alternative uh, health practices such as uh, Reiki and um, massages and so forth. We have another building that's currently under reconstruction. It is the Chuchuea Hall, which we all love, but it got too old to be, it finally got beyond its proper use, so it's had to be totally renovated, and it's a historical uh, renovation, which means that every feature of the building has remained, but a whole lot of really modern things are going into it. Now, I've talked about this aspect uh, of modern life, and you, you may be surprised, depending on how well you know statistics about Indian bands, ours is 99% employment of every working age person. Um, the 1% is a couple of new mothers 
whose infants are not old enough yet to go into the daycare center. We have a real problem getting um, suitable people uh, to employ. We try very hard to make sure they're indigenous, first of all, borrow from other bands. But we also employ Princeton people who are not indigenous and people from the Okanagan Valley who are not indigenous because we need a great deal of expertise in certain fields and it's just not available within our band. Our band works um, at the mine, at Post Mill, which is called PWP, and they have um, logging division. So um, you, this is the reason that we have this problem getting enough employees. Uh, if you were to go into our, what we call our band office, we have a receptionist and a lounge downstairs. Office space is at a premium, so most of the rest of the bottom floor of the building uh, is the Natural Resources Department. Upstairs is a big dining room and a kitchen, a waiting room, and um, I think seven or eight offices and some storage space. And we have the only elevator in Headley. <laughs> well, our disabled elders can't climb the stairs. It's just beyond. So uh, now, after I've talked about all this modern stuff, I want to mention that that is only the surface. Behind all of this, the people still maintain their traditions as best they can. I have to admit that I have never met people more inclined to have a gathering for any reason. So we have community breakfasts. If we have a band meeting, we have dinner together first. Um, Quite often, on a special occasion, there is somebody there to smudge everyone first and say the prayers. I don't know any of that stuff myself, but it's nice to have somebody who, around who does. We go to powwows. Many of our band have regalia that they wear, and Many of them are actually involved in becoming dancers at the powwows. And uh, um, we have a small drum and voice group that we can call on when we need to if we want to have fun, which we did about three weeks ago. We had our own little gathering and thoroughly enjoyed ourselves, and all the kids got out with uh, their regalia, which isn't very spectacular, <laughs> and did their dances all around the circle. I remember one little fellow, I think he couldn't have been more than three years old, who was out there, but his trusty sleeping blanket was dragging along behind him. <laughs> um, we also um, have, shall we say, a funny kind of religion. Many, many people have become Christians, but they don't drop the old belief system, which is quite a bit different from what you would expect. And I won't go into that, it's far too complex. But when you, you look at how the band lives today, and you see that their houses are modern. They have all the modern conveniences. They have um, employment. They pay income taxes. 
like everybody else does. We don't, actually, being a, an Indian band member doesn't bring you very much more than a lot more obligations to the band. Um, the surface is not the whole story. And I, I think I've talked long enough. I could take a couple of questions if... Okay, does anyone have any questions? Yes. You mentioned a couple of things. That, uh, I think you mentioned Fort Okanagan, is that correct? Yes. Now, where's that located? Down in Washington. Oh, it's down in Washington. Yeah, it's a little bit past Brewster. Do you know where Brewster is? Is it down towards Wenatchee Way or...? Uh... Yes, it is. Uh, the other thing you mentioned, you, you talked a lot about meetings, and uh, 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 you mentioned powwows, and uh, you know that term I've heard uh, many times. But uh, what type of uh, meeting is a powwow in, in, in certain respects? Like what happened, What's unique about a powwow compared to other meetings? What goes on? A powwow consists usually of three days of visiting dancing through the circle. Some are professional dancers and they compete. Um, they have to keep time with whatever a particular band is playing. And there are many groups and, um, and to become a professional, you have to give up a whole lot of things to purify yourself because each dance has a spiritual meaning to it, and you have to be a spiritual person. Somebody like me who smokes, and yeah, I couldn't be one of those unless I gave up smoking, said prayers for just about everything in my life, and, um, and yet at the same time, it's a very social occasion. So if you went to our powwow, which occurs on uh, September 1st, 2nd, and 3rd, you could get out there and dance. And it's called an intertribal dance. And everyone is welcome to get up and dance. Um, it's social in another sense. It is a time to meet people from many other bands and also to uh, make contact with your own family members. Very often a family will send out word that says, we're going to the power, where are you going? And then you start talking about, okay, you know, do you need a bed? Are you gonna reserve a, a, room, a room at the motel? What are you gonna do? And who's bringing what food? Because usually there's like a potluck supper as well. And the tradition is also, if you see somebody who is alone, not part of a family group, you always bring a lot of extra food so that those people can be invited to your group to share in your food. Nobody goes hungry at a powwow. Any other? Just wondering uh, how important language preservation is yeah. for the upper smoke people. Very important. We have people who are taking language courses now. Also, um, we have someone who is not only taking the language courses, but is working um, at natural medicines from the valley. And those are translated from one language to the other. English, of course, across Canada is the trail language of all the indigenous people. So when it's translated into um, English, then it can be shared 
knowledge. But it's very difficult because some elder will say, well, that's called such and such. And one of the things that Our Lady is doing is translating that into English so that when you collect that medicine, then you can share the knowledge because not everyone in the band, including myself, speaks the language. By the way, our language has only one comparable um, shared language, and that's with the Wet'suwet'en. Oh, these Indians get around. <laughs> you mentioned uh, Susan Allison, who was a writer, and uh, she collected stories, and, and husband, or wife of pioneer Allison, but his first wife, I believe, was a local indigenous woman. Is she, is yes. She and oh, yes, that's Nora Yakumtikum. And uh, her descendants are part of the Upper Smoke Main Band. And um, as a matter of fact, one of her descendants uh, is on the council with uh, very promising training, and he will probably be chief someday. I should explain something. You're going to meet our chief on Saturday at the banquet. Um, a lot of people think a chief is like an executive of the band or the boss, if I can put it that way, and that's not true. Uh, the upper smilk means are quite traditional, and the chief and council are servants of the band. And if you think that you know, it's really hard to get an answer out of some of these Indian chiefs. The reason is they're being traditional. They cannot individually make decisions until they've consulted the band. If the band says, ah, that's a good idea, then they can carry it out. If the band says, no, we don't want any part of it, it's done. Any more questions? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Oh, could you go ahead? Just how many people are in your band? Oh, 200 and something. Yeah. Half of the people, at least half of the people who are in our band do not live on reserve. Many more of them would live on reserve, but again, uh, we don't have enough housing, and we couldn't get more housing until we got more water. And now that we have water, we have to fill in umpteen applications so that we can utilize the band property to put up houses. So we're dealing with Ottawa again. 